Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and um, let me just briefly frame the discussion for this panel. I'm, as you've heard, James Sassoon, chairman of the China Britain Business Council, and just to underline who we've got on, on the panel, because here we are at the Margaret Thatcher conference, after all, so to have uh, not one, but two panelists uh, who were very active in UK-China relations under Margaret Thatcher is itself um, uh, great this afternoon, but they, of course, continue to be very active. So both uh, Lord Pohl of Bayswater, who was there working for Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister, in 1984, when, amongst other things, the Joint Declaration on Hong Kong was agreed, uh, and Sir Malcolm Rifkin, not only a former Foreign Secretary, but also a Defence Secretary, in the Foreign Office, I think Malcolm in the run-up to the 84 declaration, and then, of course, back in the Foreign Office as Foreign Secretary in the run-up to the handover in 97, and, and most recently considering, amongst other things, um, defense and security issues as chairman in recent years of the Intelligence and Security Committee of the House of Commons. Uh, we then have um, Dr. Kayu Jin, Associate Professor of the London <coughs> School of Economics, um, one of the um, great experts in the macroeconomic issues for China, but also with a unique perspective, born in Beijing, partly educated in the US, uh, and now living and teaching uh, in London. And finally, Professor Steve Tsang, now director of the SOAS China Institute, but many people will know you, Steve, from... Uh, Nottingham and Oxford, you've been teaching um, in the leading institutions here for many years, writing on many subjects. You've written a book recently on Xi Jinping's era, a book on Taiwan, very much involved on all the key issues. Um, let me just frame the debate by, by restating what some of you have heard before. I think the UK-China relationship is in great shape. It's not just that we saw the warmth of the relationship built up between President Xi uh, and Prime Minister Theresa May three months ago, uh, the talk of new chapter of the golden era. I was in Beijing and heard a vice premier in a meeting with me last month talking about profound friendship between um, the UK and China, not language I've heard um, uh, before in my working time. And, and I represent British business, so I'm delighted that British exports of goods and services in 2017 were up over 30%, 30.2% to China uh, last year. So our business people are very energetically <coughs> on the case and they're selling what China wants to buy. Um, but there are many questions we should get on to start discussing. Um, Hong Kong may come up, something unique a particular facet of the UK-China relationship with, which um, uh, no other country has. Uh, we've already heard references, Martin setting us the, the task of, of thinking strategically, as Mark Tucker did, um, on Belt and Road. I know that'll come up. Huge opportunity, but some see it as, as a threat. Um, to what extent is the... Um, state of the UK-China relationship now driven <coughs> by the fact that um, China and the US have embarked on a trade war? Is it some sort of zero-sum game? Um, what are the things that the UK should be working on? Again, um, rising to the challenge from um, Mark and Martin, what are the, th the areas where the UK should be working together? Yes, Belt and Road. What about technology and the many other uh, areas of business? Um, and I finally say, um, looking at one of my Chinese friends in the audience, I won't, I won't um, uh, men embarrass him by mentioning his name, but uh, um, a uh, senior Chinese official who knows, the, uh, knows Britain very well, who immediately after the state visit in 2015 said to me in Beijing, uh, golden eras don't last forever, so we'd better get on now and see what we do with it. Uh, and with that... Um, I'd first like to ask uh, Lord Pohl, Charles Pohl, uh, to give us some opening remarks. Well, thank you very much, James. I think since this is the Margaret Thatcher Conference, we should start with just a moment of history. 
Margaret Thatcher was deeply engaged with China throughout most of her prime ministership, but particularly in the earlier years when she had to discuss the future of Hong Kong with Mr. Deng Xiaoping. Now, let's not mince words. Margaret Thatcher hated the idea of handing Hong Kong back to what she regarded at the time as a communist dictatorship. Uh, that was particularly the case since we were engaged in the Falklands War and she had uh, fought that successfully. But indeed, rather like Queen Mary I, who said that she would always have Calais written on her heart, I think Margaret Thatcher always had Hong Kong written on hers. But she was realistic and she set out to fight hard to gain the maximum autonomy for Hong Kong. Her first ideas didn't exactly appeal to Mr. Deng Xiaoping. Her opening position was, don't worry about 1997. Of course, sovereignty reverts to China, but we'll go on running Hong Kong for you, Mr. Deng Xiaoping. Don't worry at all. Uh, as you can imagine, the reaction to that was um, not very positive. But she negotiated hard with enormous help with, from Geoffrey Howe, really, I think, his greatest moment as foreign secretary, and ended up with an agreement which is still observed in almost every respect today. And what she demonstrated is that you can be firm and negotiate hard with China while showing respect and still conclude an agreement. And in this case, the joint declaration on Hong Kong's future, an agreement was far, far more favorable to Hong Kong than many thought possible when the negotiations began. Now, that period was succeeded by what one might call the first golden era, when almost every conceivable Chinese leadership leader visited Britain between 1984 and 1989. Uh, they all came. Hu Yaobang, uh, uh, Jiang Zemin came as mayor, mayor of, uh, of Shanghai. I have a particularly happy memory of his visit. We knew nothing about him at the time, but he arrived to see Margaret Thatcher and announced the one thing he really wanted to do was to travel alone on the London Underground. Well, this didn't strike me as necessarily the best idea, but I had a word with uh, the security officer at number 10 who said, don't worry, sir, we'll put him on the circle line. He'll come back eventually. <laughs> um, but, of course, that gold, first golden era came to an end with the events of Tiananmen Square. And over the years, there have been plenty of setbacks in our relationship. It's just right to remember that. Um, we had troubles over people meeting the Dalai Lama. We had trouble over Hong Kong Airport other aspects of Hong Kong, over Tibet. And it's not just been the UK. Other countries have had great, great volatility in their relationships. Look at Norway, for instance. Now, of course, we shouldn't unnecessarily needlessly provoke China on these sorts of issues. But nor should we be supine if the tempests occur. We should always be ready to stick up for our principles, our values, and our interests, and not be seen as a pushover. So the message is that just bear in mind how rapidly things can change in the China-Britain relationship and take nothing for granted. Now, our objective has to be the strongest possible relationship while always acknowledging the huge differences in our societies, which in some ways are actually increasing. But we also need to be aware of the risks which could confront us and some of the difficult choices. And I'm going to list four. The first is Hong Kong, while, well, of course, we don't have any direct responsibility for Hong Kong, we do have continuing moral responsibility. We should not, we should not support attempts to claim rights for Hong Kong which were not in the joint declaration or the basic law. Those are completely unrealistic. But on the other hand, we should speak up if the promises made in those documents are put in jeopardy, even if that causes some reactions in our relations with China. Second risk, the trade war. We have a risk of being caught up in an escalating war where the friction was notched up further yesterday. As far as possible, we should stand aside from it. But although some of President Trump's objectives and negotiating tactics are absurd, such as arithmetical balancing of imports and exports, the, the uncomfortable fact is that China remains in many ways protectionist and mercantilist. And Britain shares many of President Trump's objectives on intellectual property, on, on subsidies, on, on a level playing field. We have perhaps, in some of these issues, been a bit too indulgent of China in the past. 
particularly in China's continuing developing country status in the WTO. So there's plenty to criticize in President Trump's approach, <coughs> but let's recognize he's also <coughs> fighting some of our battles and has grabbed China's attention. The third risk, a further deterioration in the wider US-China relationship. The days of low profile for China recommended by Deng Xiaoping are over. China's power is increasing, so is its propensity to exercise it, particularly in the region. And strategic competition and economic friction are bound to increase. Now, a policy of engagement on its own is not enough. It's not delivered what we hope for it, and it does need to be balanced. It needs to be balanced principally by the United States, uh, maintaining its power in the region, plus such modest support as we can lend to that. But it is likely to present us with some hard choices between our purely bilateral interests and wider strategic interests in common with other democracies. And my fourth and last, fourth and last risk is what happens after Brexit. And of course, the answer we all have on the tip of our tongue is who the hell knows. But um, I'll just say one word. Don't exaggerate the attract attractiveness to China of a bilateral free trade agreement. I think China may well prefer to keep any concessions it has to offer for the wider EU market. It may see some tactical advantage in Britain being separate from the EU. But I think I'd have to say we can't look for salvation here. A Chinese FTA is desirable, but it's not a ready-made substitute for our exporters for the European market. My conclusion, it's fine to luxuriate in the golden era and do our best to maintain it. But there are bound to be times when we have to act against our purely business and commercial interests, and we should not flinch from doing so if we have to. And that will require firm and decisive leadership of the sort Margaret Thatcher showed at <coughs> her time, both in dealing with China and in many other respects. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, earlier speeches at this splendid conference concentrated, perhaps not unreasonably, on the extraordinary transformation of China and all the significance of that. And I think we're indebted to Charles Paul uh, for, of course, reminding us that uh, the situation has areas of concern and sensitivity as well, which also have to be aired. As he said, Margaret Thatcher hated the idea of Hong Kong becoming part of mainland China because they would risk losing political liberty. And China has not changed since that happened. She realized in a pragmatic way that we had to work towards the two systems in one country. But the sad and undeniable fact is that China certainly has no more political liberty than it had at that time. And of course, we've had Tiananmen Square in between uh, which, oh, with all the horrors that that represented, but which cannot even be mentioned in China, such as the denial of free speech. Now, I'm just going to make three relatively short comments in these uh, remarks at the moment. And if one or two of them sound a bit negative, it's not because I want in any way uh, to deny China the credit for the tremendous transformation of its economy, but there needs to be a bit of balance as we assess what has been achieved. Yes, China has transformed itself in the last 30 years, but it should have happened 50 years ago. It should have happened at any time in the 20th century. We have always known that if China adopted capitalism, it would transform not only China, but make an extraordinary impact on the world. How did we know that? That's not just a theory. Because all those years that China was poor and struggling and backward, we had the examples of Hong Kong, of Taiwan, of Singapore, Chinese communities, quite apart from Japan, South Korea, and other Asian countries. So what we have seen in this extraordinary transformation since Deng Xiaoping was not, I have to say to Lord Saatchi, it's not that China now has socialism with Chinese characteristics, it has capitalism with Chinese characteristics. It is capitalism that has transformed China into the extraordinary economy uh, that we have seen, and being vastly larger than Singapore, Hong Kong, or Taiwan, of course, the impact is global uh, rather than regional. And the Chinese characteristics, sadly, are not so much economic characteristics, though they include the capital investment, uh, 
and matters of that kind, but also the denial of political liberty in what is otherwise a market economy. We always used to assume capitalism had to be a decentralized system in order to achieve <coughs> its full potential. Uh, who knows what the potential of China might be uh, if the political constraints, the political freedom uh, on hundreds of millions of Chinese uh, was relaxed in a significant way. That's the first point I wanted to make. The second point, of course, in terms of the United Kingdom's position is we cannot forget, as uh, Charles Paul correctly mentioned, our responsibilities in regard to Hong Kong. Now, Chinese government say we have no responsibilities. Hong Kong is now part of China. It is now history, but that is not the case. It's an international treaty between China and the United Kingdom, deposited at the United Nations, and it commits China for 50 years, and we've only had 20 years so far, uh, to respect two systems in one country, not just the letter, but hopefully the spirit as well. Now, I want to pay credit to China, the Chinese government, that in the first 20 years of the 50 years, we still have two systems in one country. Hong Kong remains dramatically different from mainland China, both the political liberty uh, of its people and uh, all the other social and economic characteristics that we are familiar with. And I pay all credit to the Chinese government for having carried out uh, many of the strict letter of the, of the obligations that they had. But have they carried out the spirit of it? And if, if there is an area that we should be most anxious about, which certainly the people of Hong Kong are anxious about, it has been in the regard to the rule of law in Hong Kong. Not that it's gone, it still has an independent judiciary, but we have seen in some respects a real erosion of the rule of law in Hong Kong. And in other respects, we've seen proposals from Beijing, which if they had been accepted and not given rise to huge opposition, uh, would have eroded that rule of law even further. Now, Lord Sassoon mentioned that I was foreign secretary at the time of the final stages of the transition uh, from Britain to China. And I remember vividly a visit I made to Beijing after having been for a day or so in Hong Kong to see the Chinese foreign minister, Chen Chi Chen. And when I'd been in Hong Kong, the people of Hong Kong whom I met said almost uniformly, the business community as well as the political people do emphasize on to the Chinese government that what is crucial when Hong Kong becomes part of China is not just a question of the political rights of the people of Hong Kong, whether they'll have two candidates or three candidates rather than one candidate to vote for in elections. But what's perhaps even more important is the continuing enjoyment of the rule of law. Because Hong Kong under the British was not democratic, but it did have the rule of law. And when I saw the Chinese foreign minister, I made this point, and I've never forgotten his answer. He said, don't worry, Mr. Rifkin. We in China, uh, we believe in the rule of law. In China, the people must obey the law. <laughs> and I had to point out to him that when we talked about the rule of law, it wasn't just the people who had to obey the law and be under the law, it was the government itself had to be under independent courts and independent judges. And I think not only did he not agree with me, I don't think he understood what I was talking about. Because I think in China, and it's one similarity they have with Russia, it would better be described not as the rule of law, but rule by law. You use the legal system and the courts ultimately to impose your political control and to present, prevent any serious challenge to it. And that, that is something which uh, inevitably has implications for the future of Hong Kong. The third and final thing I want to refer to uh, is, of course, that the transformation of China, this extraordinary transformation, has not just been an economic one. Because as China has become hugely important econ economically, with vast resources at its disposal, we've seen a transformation of its military capability. And we've seen China, for the first time virtually in its history, uh, becoming a naval power of real significance. Because the extraordinary thing about the Chinese empire was with one episode hundreds of years ago, one exception hundreds of years ago, China never sought a maritime policy beyond its own shores in a significant way. It does today. It now has a base in Djibouti in, uh, on, near the Suez Canal. Uh, it now has uh, port facilities in Pakistan. It has 70% uh, ownership of a port in uh, Sri Lanka. It has an aircraft carrier newly uh, constructed. It has uh, very significant military capabilities. So the point I want to make, and it's not just the, on the sea, sh the, the sea lanes, it is also the uh, uh, Central Asian Initiative, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, is they're not just economic, these are geopolitical. The huge attempt that uh, China will successfully make, I think, along with uh, support from many people, 
to link, for the first time in human history, Europe and China, not just by sea, which has been the traditional way of getting access, but by land through Central Asia, uh, will have profound significance. And the big losers in the short term will be Russia, because Russia traditionally has assumed its primacy in uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, these countries of Central Asia. And already they are becoming economically uh, not insignificant, but very much the junior partner. Final remark in regard to the sea lanes, because the United Kingdom, perhaps even more after Brexit, will be a more, uh, more emphasis on its maritime policy. What happens in that part of the world, because it's a very long way away, nevertheless affects us. It's perhaps worth remembering that no less than 12% of our uh, trade in goods, 12% goes through the South China Sea. And if the South China Sea, which despite its name, is not next to China, its closest neighbors are Indonesia, uh, Borneo, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines. If the South China Sea, and particularly the Spratly Islands, are now not only being controlled increasingly by the Chinese government, but are being militarized with uh, military bases being established there, there's clear evidence of that, then we have to wait and see uh, whether that is going to increasingly be not just an opportunity, but potentially a threat. Uh, there's a real nervousness amongst China's neighbors. Recently, for the first time in history, India and Japan jointly had a naval exercise. What on earth do India and Japan have in common except China? And that nervousness is shared in Vietnam, it's shared in Indonesia, it's shared in Australia, and other countries. So I make these points uh, not to belittle what China has achieved, but simply saying that what we've seen in human history is that whenever a country transforms itself into a global power, then there, are, there is nervousness amongst their neighbors, not just economic uh, opportunities. It happened with the British Empire. It happened when the Americans became the global power. It happened with Germany after Bismarck in the 1870s. And it's too early to say for certain whether it's going to happen with China. Deng Xiaoping always used to emphasize that we have no uh, ambitious or aggressive uh, roles. We don't wish to throw our weight around. More difficult to argue that that's not uh, the case, uh, that, that that is still the case with Xi Jinping. So I simply conclude by saying I think on these political issues, the jury is out. Uh, I do not hope, I hope very much that they will not inhibit the economic cooperation. And that can happen with new powers, old powers, and countries that are no longer powers. Uh, and uh, the more that that happens, the better. Thank you very much indeed. First of all, let me say how thrilled I am to be here as a Chinese national living uh, in London. Uh, to be part of this esteemed group committed to enhancing the relationship between our two great countries. Now, the Industrial Revolution was considered one of the most important events in history because for the first time, within one human life, a person's income increased by 75%. Under plausible projections about China's future growth, people born of my generation after Deng Xiaoping's opening up and reform programs, it is highly plausible that we would have seen our income and living standards rise by 75-fold. That is the remarkable transformation of China. Back in the days of the Industrial Revolution, these various countries had to define their relationship with Great Britain. Today, it's very possible that many countries are thinking about how they want to uh, relate themselves to the rise of China. Now, the word that best captures, in my view, various countries' sentiment towards China's rise is ambivalence. Now, on the one hand, various countries in Asia and Europe want to enhance economic cooperation because there is a lot of room for cooperation that will uh, be beneficial for not only China but for the respective countries. On the other hand, as we've also just heard, there is the view that China poses as a real threat to global uh, political stability. Now, that view tends to push, China, uh, push countries 
towards working closer with America, with the United States, because only then can the containment of China be possible. Now that kind of ambivalence is, I believe, a very prevalent sentiment. But I actually found, living here in London, that the U United Kingdom, UK, has been tremendously open-minded, much more than most other countries, most other industrialized Western countries, towards welcoming China and China's investment in cooperation with China. But as America pursues more of its America First policies, as President Trump steers the US away from its global leadership, I think the consequence is that it will push various countries closer to working uh, with China. Now, if the, objective, if the objective is to enhance uh, the relationship between a country with China, I'd say that the first thing that one needs to do is to kind of break the mental shackles one has about this enigmatic, strange creature. We find it very strange because it has risen to prosperity through very unconventional paths. It hasn't risen to prosperity with Adam Smith's invisible hands, but rather Buddha Guanyin's thousand very clear and obvious and prevalent ubiquitous state interventions and hands. And these kind of mobilization economics with which we are not familiar was one big part of um, China's rise in the recent years. So we deal with China, um, or let's say the misperceptions about China come from the fact that a lot of these issues surrounding China are either emotionally charged or ideologically charged. Did they steal our jobs? Did they displace our workers? How, can it, how could it have, how could a, you know, authoritarian regime with collective leadership, not a liberal democracy, uh, s succeed economically. We have these emotionally charged issues. Now, rather than blame trade, one should ask the question, how much it has to do with technology? Technological progress has much more as a factor contributed to the displacement of workers than trade. Is the trade surplus with China, which, by the way, has come down from 10% of GDP to 1% of GDP over the course of 10 years, is it really because of unfair trade practices, or is it because of economic success of China? The fact that they produce more they consume, rather than the other side in the Americans, which is that they consume more they produce. A lot of these issues are emotionally charged, and therefore we, have, we, tend, to, you know, we tend to go towards this more kind of misconception about China's rise. Now, the very fact of the matter is that, in my view, that an uh, economic growth model that has helped lift 800 million people out of poverty has built infrastructure and given access to education and health to so many Chinese is also a form of human rights, of, of giving you know, human dignity to a large group of people. So um, coming back to how the most important question of the century is how is China going to exert its global leadership role? That must be, what is the defining characteristics of that? Post-war US defined it with um, universal values and export of moral, you know, moral universalism and export of values. China is not going to pursue that. The essence of China's global leadership is economic pragmatism. Whether you like it or not, that is the essence of what it's trying to do. In a today, when the world is in a deep need of infrastructure development. And here, we're not talking just about developing countries. I think most of us would never say they admire the JFK Kennedy Airport um, in America. When monetary policy is such that interest rates are at the zero lower bound, this is a chance for a fiscal policy all around the world to be able to help uh, stimulate the economy. So the world needs infrastructure development. Interestingly enough, everyone has heard of Belt Road Initiative. They have probably heard of the One Belt, One Road. I, I suspect that few of you would have understood why um, the name got changed from One Belt, One Road to Belt Road Initiative. And the reason is that the focus too much on the one, one maritime linkage, one uh, land route, um, was uh, giving the notion that it was a very China-centric effort. Now, that's another 
deep misconception about what that is, what this Belt Road project is about. In fact, it is five different links and routes that will link together Europe, Asia, and Africa. So the Belt Road offers as a new global concept, as Martin had said, a project, a platform for various countries to cooperate. And speaking about what the UK or what kind of participation, participatory role the UK can have in, the, in this project, one has to understand what that concept is about. The concept is to link various countries' comparative advantage. We're not talking solely about infrastructure. We're talking about finance. We're talking about logistics. We're talking about uh, governance issues. We're talking about, uh, of course, uh, manufacturing and technology, all these various aspects providing a global platform for different countries to cooperate. Hence, the initiative behind the Belt Road Initiative is trying to signal, no, this is not a China-centric, China-focused program. It is China trying to enable uh, by you know, paying the initial fixed costs of setting up a program, a platform, so that countries can work on global projects together. Finally, let me say that Apart from the Belt Road Initiative, which has, of course, garnered a lot of attention, there are so many areas, aspects of cooperation between the two countries. It is probably the first time in history that a country with only 25% of the richest country's GDP, or one of the richest countries' GDP, US, it's the first time in history that it has become a technological leader in many key areas. We used to think about China being the copycat model, but now, many of its business models are being copied rather than the other way around. Um, I think that the reason why China was able to succeed <coughs> was that, economically speaking, is that it followed one principle. Don't let politics get in the way of economic development. So when we think carefully about labeling China as a threat, saying that Chinese investments of any kind are threats to national security when we want to stop China from investing infrastructure or at least enable that program to invest in infrastructure in poor countries. This is also something I think we should remember. Don't let politics get in the way of economic development. Thank you. I will try to keep to the uh, five minutes that we've been allocated. You may be pleased to know. Um, I was asked to talk about the big picture. I think I will come into it from a slightly different perspective Each of the golden era of Sino-British relations. I think it's easy to look at this and see this as a unprecedented strong uh, relationship. I would like to remind everybody that in, fa in fact the United Kingdom and China have been partners, friends for a long time. We were wartime allies, and not only in name. British forces fought side by side with Chinese forces in the Second World War in Burma, and British units also operated in China, units like the British Army A Group. And that wartime period was not only just about military cooperation and assistance. Now that Chiang Kai-shek, China's wartime leader, had his personal diary released, from those diaries we know that between 1938 and 1942, when one Sir Archibald Clark was British ambassador to China, believe it or not, he was one foreign advisor, or indeed one advisor that Chiang Kai-shek relied on most. He had plenty of generals and able administrators in the Chinese government. He couldn't always mm. trust them and talk to, the, talk to them freely. Archibald Kakke was somebody that Chiang Kai-shek relied on to sign out his ideas about the war and the post-war order. It was a very strong relationship all through that war time. And at the end of the war, when China in the post-war world started to rebuild its navy, well, yes, the bulk of the post-war Chinese Navy were ex-Japanese ships with a few American destroyers. 
But what was the Chinese flagship? The CNS Chongqing. That was formerly HMS Aurora. It was a gift from the Royal Navy that was a cruiser and a flagship of the Chinese Navy. The United Kingdom was also the first major world power, apart from the Soviet Union of the Socialist Bloc, which accorded the People's Republic of China full diplomatic recognition on the 6th of January, 1950. Before anybody else, before we even knew what the new Chinese government would or would not do, the United Kingdom took the lead to recognize China. In the 1980s, when China started with the Deng Xiaoping reform, or indeed from the start of the Deng Xiaoping reform in December 1978, one of the biggest contributions to the success of the Deng Xiaoping reform was the role that was played by British Hong Kong. I do not want to belittle the role that Margaret Thatcher played and her minister, foreign minister and foreign secretary played in negotiating for a deal for Hong Kong. But we also need to recognize that when China agreed in the 1980s and kept its promise in 1997 for Hong Kong to have its different system from China, it was not only because of the treaty that was being signed, important as it was, it was also because Hong Kong was so incredibly important for the success of the Deng Xiaoping reforms. China is where it is today because of the fantastically important positive role that British Hong Kong played in this development. And of course, I think Sir Malcolm was right to say that that is something that we want to put, uh, continue. Now, I, I will end, I hope lots of you will know, uh, will hear that I am going to end on the note that where do we go from now? I give you a picture of how much the United Kingdom had been, in some ways, very positively helping, assisting China in its development and achievements. But the world has changed. I think we heard a lot about that. Martin gave a fantastic exposition of how the world has changed. China does not need our help any longer. China is now a peer partner of the United Kingdom. For peer partners, it will be utterly disrespectful, disrespectful on our part if we do not simply treat it as an equal peer. And between friends, reciprocity is the key word. That is what we should be insisting on. It's not about whether we should or should not be more welcoming to Chinese investments. Of course we should. But equally, we would expect and ask for the Chinese government to treat British investments in China on the same basis that Chinese businesses and investments and visitors in this country are being treated as good friends. Thank you very much. Steve, thanks very much for making sure we didn't slip further behind, but we've still got, I think, about 25 minutes for getting a discussion going. And um, I assume there are mi microphones that will come round if you want to join um, the conversation. But we've had um, a lot of issues on which we've had some varied voices already. And, and perhaps the place to start, because Charles kicked off, mentioned, well, I mentioned Hong Kong, but Charles kicked off in substance Hong Kong as one of the, uh, uh, the first of the areas of potential difficulty. And then, Malcolm, you... You, you cast some quite severe doubts over the rule of Hong Kong. I mean, is this Hong Kong in which um, the president of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom has just agreed to become a, a judge on the Court of Final Appeal? So what is, what is going on here? So I just wonder to talk a little bit about, more about Hong Kong. Um, and I know, Steve, you, look, you, you mentioned Hong Kong, but... but First of all, Charles, do you want to say a little bit more about what you see either in the context of rule of law or other issues that, that could come up in Hong Kong as a significant difficulty in the relationship with the UK and China? 
Well, I thought I gave my basic view in my remarks was that uh, what was achieved for Hong Kong in uh, 1984 was very creditable, that it's been observed in the, almost in entirety since then, and that Hong Kong has remained remarkably the same as it, as it was. Um, and of course, there have been some changes. There are issues around, as we all know. On one side, we have a generation of people who simply don't know the history and believe that Hong Kong is entitled to independence. I mean, that's nuts. It's complete nuts. Um, there was no mention of independence. There never has been. And the idea that that can be presented and taken up by human rights campaigners in some parts of the world as a credible future for Hong Kong, I mean, it's just, well, words fail me. Um, there are other issues on which I think Hong Kongers do feel uneasy, in the security field in particular, to some extent in the education field, where the, the facts of history that uh, their children are to, are to be presented with don't really accord with, let's say, the whole reality. Um, but I think these are, by and large, reasonably minor issues. And Hong Kong, of course, it's rowdy, it's a little bit chaotic in its politics, but that's always been one of the strengths of Hong Kong, that it's not conformist. It doesn't, and everyone doesn't salute and obey. Um, they argue, uh, and, but they get there in the end. So I'm not at all worried about Hong Kong's future in general, though there will be problems along the way, and if they arise, we in Britain must be prepared to speak up if, they're, if the complaints are justified. Um, thanks, Charles. I'd like to come back to Malcolm in a moment, and particularly this question you raised, speaking up. I mean, what is the balance uh, of getting the, the, the most effective response, speaking up in public or, or speaking privately in Beijing? But maybe, Malcolm, you'd like to come back on that in a minute. But, mm -hmm. but after Steve, do you want to add a word on, on the Hong Kong issues? Oh, yes. Um, I think uh, Charles is right to flag up the issue of Hong Kong independence. But let's not forget that if you go back about five years, there was no independence movement in Hong Kong. There wasn't really much even of a call for independence in Hong Kong. It happened largely as a result of the uh, use of excessive force by the local police against the Occupy movement of, 19, uh, of 2014, which then became the Ambera uh, protest. And it was out of that that people in Hong Kong and with their decisions to, with their options of directly electing the chief executive also being closed off, that some people in Hong Kong talk about it. It's not a movement. I don't think there is an independence movement in Hong Kong. And I don't see that as really a viable option for Hong Kong either. But I think we also need to bear in mind that if we don't flag up the issue about where Hong Kong is and how that actually happened, the Chinese government may not actually necessarily see what is the right things to do. And that is where I think uh, I agree with Sir Malcolm's that tracking up the issue of rule of law now is the right things to do. We should not wait until rule of law has disappeared before we flag it up. It's something that we have to work for, we have to protect on a daily basis anywhere, even in democracies, we have to do that. And we have to remind our Chinese friends that Hong Kong is important for all of us. We share the same common interest that Hong Kong will remain vibrant and successful and contribute to China. Yes, I, I don't want to exaggerate the point I was making earlier, but I do think it has to be recognized that in a number of respects, there has been a gradual attempt at eroding uh, traditional liberties, traditional freedoms, and the rule of law in Hong Kong. Let me just give two examples. There are a lot of examples that can be given. Let me give two. They're quite well known. Uh, a bookseller in Hong Kong, uh, who was simply abducted by the Chinese security people, uh, removed to China, and held there for a very considerable period of time. Second example, we, many of us will remember the Umbrella Movement, which was overwhelmingly a non-violent protest by young Chinese, perhaps a bit naive, perhaps a bit unrealistic, but thousands of them were demonstrating, and a significant number of their leadership has been given terms of imprisonment. And there will be a debate as to exactly what they were found guilty of. But, you know, the protests in Hong Kong are the sort of things which were happening in every uh, Western country uh, as simply as an expression of free speech, large numbers of young people demonstrating for a different point of view. I happen to agree with Charles. Independence is absurd. 
but it's a point of view that people are perfectly, or ought to be perfectly entitled to argue. The difficulty we have, and it's the final point I make, is that just as the Chinese in the whole of China do not allow any discussion about human rights in Tibet or Xinjiang, or even <laughs> in, in China uh, for the rest of the population, they want gradually to achieve a similar self-restraint in Hong Kong so that people understand the barriers that are expected of them if they wish to have career promotion, if they wish to be recognized for other opportunities. There are all sorts of insidious ways. I mean, if you wish to put pressure on people, you can do so, even if you technically don't change the law. Malcolm, thank you. It's so nice being occasionally the chairman. I mean, just to make the point, of course, that some of those sentences um, on the protesters were recently reduced by um, the Court of Final Appeal um, in Hong Kong, a panel of judges which in, in that case included um, uh, Lord Hoffman. So um, uh, they are very important and, 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 and difficult issues. But I think we ought to move on to another area where there was some uh, controversy between panelists, but, but an agreement, I think, of the enormous economic opportunity between the UK and China, which is Belt and Road, BRI. And, and Kay, you, you, you sketched out some of it, the enormity of the project. We, we saw it graphically. Martin showed us the, uh, the, 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 the map with the, the five corridors and more on it. But, but you said, Kay, you, I think at one point, um, don't let politics get in the way of economic development. I mean, I think we probably all agree that there is enormous business opportunity for the UK to work with um, our partners in China here. But then we, we heard a bit from, from um, both Charles and Malcolm what some of the fears are. Um, you know, is it possible for China to be really carrying out this project, leading it? You said it isn't entirely a Chinese project, but how do you respond um, to um, people who, like Malcolm and Charles, know China very well, they know the thinking, they're not coming from some um, unthinking critical background, who, who do point out that, you know, we shouldn't look at this entirely um, without, um, you know, critical thinking. I think that um, there are uh, many areas in which China has to work significantly on, and I want to list a few of the points where I am. I have my reservations about uh, China and China's growth. But first of all, let me say that the China shock, it's a one-time shock, and it's over. It's done. The trade, the inflows, the fluxes of knowledge and traded goods and financial capitals that's driven by China's uh, growth, that's already over. So. Um, the economic and financial history that will be written by China is what we should be looking forward if China tries to liberalize its financial accounts. Trade accounts, trade liberalization, it's been over. On trade, I want to I say that despite the fact that trade frictions are obviously um, to be uh, avoided, I do actually believe that it is time for China to be opening up. And China, whether we want to accept this view or not, the Chinese government has come to the awareness that it is now time for China to start giving back to the global system from which it has benefited so much. We haven't seen much efforts yet, but I can tell you that the thinking or the frame of mind is already there. Second, it is, I agree, it is ridiculous for China to be imposing direct technological transfers if foreign companies want to come to China to work with China. Uh, it, is, uh, also, uh, it also makes very little sense to impose so much high tariffs on you know, cars, wine, and cheese, and things that the Chinese consumers can enjoy. Because China is no longer at a stage of development where infant industry protection is warranted. When a country starts to grow, you want to protect some of its industries, and it's, under, it's easy to understand, but China has long graduated from that stage of development, and actually only by inviting the best technological companies to come work in China, invest in China, by liberalizing the financial markets, can there be another impetus to China's growth. So on that, even though I disagree with the kind of the political and the trade frictions that have risen, I do believe in general that um, uh, China should be headed towards being a fairer, um, playing a fairer share in the global system. On the 
politics, on the political, geopolitical side, I think that um, it's interesting that if we really study carefully uh, economic history, uh, China is not the first country to have risen very rapidly uh, in uh, economics, um, accumulated a huge amount of external surplus, external wealth, and is trying to internationalize its financial center and its currency. Actually, we started with this country in the 19th century, where there was a huge amount of capital flowing abroad to emerging markets to invest in infrastructure. Then was the United States, and things like the Marshall Plan is just an illustration where some of this could be put into uh, good use. So I don't want to you know, belittle the notion that there is a general concern about the geopolitical aspects, but you want to ask the question, is it about economic benefits for many different countries, for people, for a wide group of people, for helping development, and will it achieve that? And I think that is the question we need to focus on. Okay, well, let's come on to that. You didn't directly rise to the kind of Djibouti challenge, but I won't, I won't press you any further on that. But, but you, you talk about the economic challenge, and um, I think, Charles, you talked about the attractions of a free trade agreement. Um, I mean, you made the wider point about uh, uh, whatever the benefits to the UK and China of a free trade agreement, which you sounded very positive about, they're not, they're not in the, that in itself isn't going to sort of deal with the wider UK um, post-Brexit um, question. But, but I just I want to spend a moment or two on, on the free trade agreement question, because there are some um, key British opinion formers on China who say, and Peter Mandelson has written in the Financial Times, for example, perhaps he's a lone voice, but Peter, who knows China extraordinarily well, has had to negotiate with China on trade, after all, um, would say, and I think I paraphrase him, is he here, is Peter here? No. So I can paraphrase him by, by saying, I think he would say that the UK is already so open, um, allows China to do so much here, that we have so little to offer, uh, that, um, you know, what's the point? Not a viewpoint I agree with, but, but Steve, do you want to say anything about free trade agreements and whether China is or should be interested in, um, in talking to the UK? I think what you paraphrase of Peter Mendelssohn is, is right. Uh, we are very, very open, which is essentially why uh, I ended my five minutes with the word reciprocity. I'm delighted that uh, Kerry is saying that China should be opening up. Um, it is where we really need China to go and to appreciate that the long-standing friends, I mean, no country, no major economy in the world is more open and welcoming to Chinese investments and Chinese trade and Chinese visitors than the UK. And it really should, in a sense, be reflected in how China, how China treats uh, British investments and businesses and visitors in China. At the moment, it's not quite the same. So we, we need to move a lot more in that direction. And the incentive should be not just what it can be done with the UK. And by doing it with the UK, sets the example to show what uh, Dr. Lin has uh, uh, talked about in terms of the sincerity of the Chinese government in how it wants to play this new role in global affairs. It needs to put uh, money where its mouth is. Can I, can I yeah, just add something? On, um, uh, services as a percent of GDP is about 50%. This is uh, far below the 75 to 80% in advanced economies. So this is an area in which service trade could potentially be um, an area of cooperation. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, I think that the internationalization of the currency, and as I've you know, said, China is really trying to, interna uh, tr trying to make international financial markets liberalized. I think that China could assist London um, in still maintaining or enhancing the international financial center role by uh, putting a lot of its uh, activities of the RMB and the currency trade uh, in London. And lastly, um, I mentioned technology. I didn't really quite explicate. But for those of you who are not familiar with that um, sector in China, it is really booming and bustling, and it offers so many uh, opportunities. And this is why I'm optimistic about China's economic future is really how much of a digital economy is able to transform itself. 
And I understand that here, we also have a focus on innovation and technology. And I think that with China's big market, big data, with uh, the technological innovation and capacities here, that's another area in which there could be uh, greater cooperation. Uh, thanks, Kayu, and I, I agree with all of that. And, and there is certainly an awful lot that the UK um, first has to offer and can gain from bilateral um, agreements. I mean, here we have HSBC. I'm reminded, looking behind me, at, uh, as the sponsors today. I mean, it's fine, it's fine for the world's banks to be able to own majority ownership of financial services firms, but if when they can come to get um, detailed licenses for specific areas of business, it's not a level playing field, then ownership only gets you so far, and one can see that across lots of areas. So I have no doubt that the UK has an awful lot. We shouldn't think we can teach China a lot in many areas, but I think there's a, there's a lot of interest to China here in many areas of technology, including financial services. But the question is, uh, you know, what do we have to offer? I mean, it does seem to me, but maybe I should throw this back to Charles because actually he put it on the table first. It does seem to me that actually um, what, what we offer China here, Charles, in, in um, access to our nuclear industry, and in technology partnerships are things which are there at the moment, but which could go away very quickly if the political sentiment um, uh, changes, which um, you know perhaps could happen. I don't know if there's not a willingness on both sides to actually roll up the sleeves and have a free trade agreement, but is that the way to analyze well, it? Let me just make two or three related points. One is China's technological spurt in the last five years or so has been remarkable, so remarkable that one, it would be slightly unkind perhaps to speculate quite how it's been made so rapid, uh, but I think we all know where some of it has come from, and I won't say more than that. On the question of politics not interfering with development, I think that's a slightly curious statement. Uh, politics is ever more involved in China's current economic development. The role of the party in companies is increased, not diminished. Party secretaries appear on boards or dominate boards, even for foreign companies. And for me, that is involving politics in economic development. My third point will go back to something Martin Jake said, that we shouldn't expect China to change in our direction and accept the system, the global system, as it is. And of course, I don't expect them to do that. But I do point out that China has benefited hugely from the rules of the present system um, and will continue to do so as long as it observes them. And to say that you know, somehow they would be entitled to deviate from them because they weren't involved in the construction of them, I think is not really the right view to hold. Lastly, on the free trade agreement, well, yes, we are much more open than anyone else. But of course, that's not true of all our European neighbors and many of whom have many more restrictions on Chinese companies than we do. And indeed, we're much more open than the United States as well. Um, all the more reason for China to take a benign attitude to the interests of our companies in its market and be ready, if we have a bilateral free to trade agreement, to open up more, particularly to British firms. Malcolm, do you want to add anything on the trade? Well, front? yes, I would simply say that I mean, I, I'm on the skeptical end of the spectrum as to whether there are all these fantastic free trade agreements ready to be negotiated, either with China or with a number of other countries. But actually, we have a marvelous opportunity to find out. At the moment, there are simply assertions on both sides of the argument about whether we should be, remain in a customs union or whether there is, we would lose a chance for free trade agreements. Now, we know because of the transitional agreements that have already been accepted that we're actually going to be de facto in a customs union for at least the next three years. And there's nothing to stop us, either with China or other countries, if they're willing, to start the discussion as to what would be the basis of a bilateral agreement if that was to prove uh, possible in the light of Britain leaving the European Customs uh, Union. And over the next year, 18 months, we couldn't agree, uh, reach a conclusion. It become pretty obvious by then how much was actually likely to be on the table, either from China or the United States or any of these countries. And therefore, a final decision could be taken in the UK based not on confident assertions based, with no evidence uh, to support them, but on the basis of what actually happens when you start talking to the Americans and the Chinese. How keen are they on a bilateral agreement? What would they be prepared to offer? And what would they expect from the UK? We don't know that at the moment. We've got a year and a half to find out at least.
uh, before we need to come to a decision. Um, Malcolm, thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to draw things to a close. We had a, an incredibly wide-ranging um, discussion that goes much further than the bilateral relationship, but I don't think anybody on the panel is challenging um, the very good state of the bilateral relationship as it is now. Um, I thought what uh, Keu had to say about um, the comparison of the UK with either the ambivalence or the outright hostility now of, of other large countries um, is encouraging. Um, we've been reminded frequently about the need to raise our sights and look at the relationship in strategic and long-term uh, uh, way, and of course, amongst other things, um, the post-Brexit trade arrangements and Belt and Road gives us some very large um, uh, opportunities to um, think big and think ahead. So I am greatly encouraged by all of that, and um, thank you very much, um, Charles, Malcolm, Kayu, and Steve, um, for this panel session. Thank you. Thank you.